I took care of the paralyzed female CEO for two years, and after she recovered, the first thing she did was propose to the unforgettable first love who had abandoned her. The media called it a love story of undying devotion and ultimate union. I looked up at the giant screen in the square, silently watching the live broadcast of the proposal, and then threw the ring in my pocket into the trash. The debt I owed her has finally been repaid. Chapter 1 People on the pedestrian street stopped walking, looking up at the outdoor screens broadcasting the live proposal. Not just here, but all over South City. Every available screen was showing the same proposal. The image was so clear that you could even see the faint glimmer of tears in the female lead's eyes. The layout of the scene was obviously Gail Lou's work. In those last few months when she was almost fully recovered, she spent her time sketching this design, even overseeing the style of the fireworks herself. Back then, she would lean on my chest, her eyes full of anticipation, asking me what my favorite flower was. I said, hyacinth. But on the big screen, the entire proposal scene was surrounded by a sea of passionate red roses, and the men standing there wasn't me. It was Gail's ex-boyfriend, the star designer Peter. I calmly looked up as the proposal progressed to the point where Gail, wearing a white veil and with tears in her eyes, handed the ring to Peter. The diamond in the black velvet box sparkled like a star, making the ring in my pocket seem insignificant. The girls beside me squealed excitedly. Gail Liu, the female CEO of the Liu Corporation, is so beautiful. No wonder she was such a heartbreaker. Now it seems the playgirl has finally settled down. I heard Peter gave up everything to take care of Gail during the two years she was paralyzed. What a fairy tale romance. Ending in marriage. I silently clenched my wrist, where there were still grayish scars from taking care of Gail. At that time, Peter had broken up with Gail and gone to Milan to further his studies. The crowd soon held its breath as the proposal reached its most critical moment. Gail lowered her head, looking at the young man kneeling in front of her, and choked up, saying, I do. The ring slid onto her ring finger. Peter stood up and kissed her lips and in that moment, fireworks exploded across the sky over South City. This display wasn't just known in South City, probably the whole country knew by now. But that's typical of Gail's personality. When she loves someone, she wants the whole world to know. The crowd buzzed with excitement, and the girl next to me, caught up in the moment, grabbed my wrist, squeezing with excitement, they're such a perfect match, don't you think? I endured the pain in my wrist and smiled. Perfect. She noticed my pale face and awkwardly let go, trying to apologize but I had already turned and walked away amidst the noise. On the giant screen behind me, the main characters were locked in a passionate kiss, and the crowd cheered and screamed for their love as fireworks lit up the sky. Suddenly, I stopped beside a trash can. I crouched down for a moment to catch my breath, then stood up and took out a dull ring from my pocket. The ring was ugly and too tight. Fortunately, I no longer had any reason to keep it. I tossed the ring into the trash can, feeling more at peace than ever before. Not a single tear fell. From now on, the debt I owed to the Lou family, the debt I owed to Gail, has been repaid. Chapter 2 I was kicked out of the Lou Corporation. I used to have my own office, but now I couldn't even find a desk. The HR department handed me a cardboard box, assistant he, all your things are in here. I got along well with people in the company. So she lowered her voice and said, President Lou personally asked you to leave. You'll get your compensation, so it's best to go quickly. She was being polite. I guess Gail's exact words were probably to kick me out, with those indifferent. Fox-like eyes, she probably didn't even think twice about it. I struggled to carry the box, and as I passed by my old office, I finally realized who its new occupant was. It had been turned into Peter's lounge, with scattered design drafts lying around. Photos of him and Gail, looking intimate, now covered what used to be a meticulously planned schedule. I lowered my gaze, my knuckles widening as I gripped the edge of the box for a moment, but I quickly let go. Forget it. Chapter 3 I was pushed and fell at the entrance of the company causing the cardboard box to topple over, scattering its contents all over the ground. There were too many people gathered here, and someone's high heel stepped on the back of my hand, causing a sharp pain. The swarming reporters and crowd all surged in one direction. I endured the pain and looked up, just in time to see Peter walking arm in arm with Gail. He loves the spotlight. Even his hair is meticulously styled, but the woman next to him is even more dazzling, with her black hair and red lips. Gail doesn't like crowds like this. She turned her head slightly in annoyance but still cooperated by leaning into Peter's embrace. The reporters blocked Peter, thrusting microphones towards him, and questions were thrown at him one after another. Mr. Wong, the topic of the century's proposal has dominated the internet for a week. As the leading man, what do you have to say? Peter smiled. I'm very grateful that during the two years when she was at her lowest, I was the one by her side. Gail Liu, the eldest daughter of the Liu family, had always been smooth sailing standing at the peak. Only during the two years after her car accident, when she was paralyzed, did she experience the coldness of the world. 
No one is more qualified to say this than Peter. He was the first to fly away, leaving only me by Gail's side. Such an obvious lie. But Gail seemed pleased, not arguing and even indulging it. Gail lowered her eyes, smiling gently and helplessly. It was like a wildfire finally meeting a river, where it would halt. The camera flashes clicked continuously as the entertainment reporters joyfully captured the moment of deep affection between the two. Gail suddenly turned her head, her gaze cold as she looked straight at me across the crowd. I quietly looked back at her, smiling faintly, feeling very at ease. She frowned subconsciously. Actually, I'm also very grateful that during those two years when she was at her lowest, I was the one who stayed by Gail's side. My debt of gratitude is fully repaid. Chapter 4 the taxi I was waiting for took forever to arrive. I started feeling a bit hypoglycemic and had a stomach ache, so I crouched down by the roadside, holding my stomach. The hand that had been stepped on earlier was now red, swollen, and bleeding, hurting a lot. To Gail, Peter is indeed quite special. I've known Gail for a long time. She's been the Lou family's eldest daughter since she was a child, and as she grew up, rumors surrounded her, but Peter was the only boyfriend she publicly acknowledged. A rekindled romance is reasonable. Suddenly, a car horn sounded in front of me. I instinctively looked up to see a black car stopping before me. The window slowly rolled down, revealing Gail's delicate face, her fingers tapping on the steering wheel, stomach hurting again. My eyelashes trembled slightly. She sneered, her eyes mocking and filled with disdain. Serves you right. I lowered my eyes. It felt like I was back two years ago, with Gail treating me the same way. Back then, she was just as harsh to me. She said that for someone like me, just being alive was already a blessing. Now I realize that her later tenderness was all an act. She was afraid that if I left, there would be no one to take care of her. I simply ignored her. I heard footsteps behind me, and Peter walked past me, getting into the passenger seat. Gail, I'm late. Those reporters were too persistent. I shouldn't have let you go ahead. You could have helped me fend them off. As Peter fastened his seatbelt, he turned his head and saw me. His voice suddenly choked up, his face turning a little pale. He hurriedly urged, Gail, let's go. We're running late for the party. Gail unintentionally furrowed her brows. Enduring the pain, I looked up at Gail, estimating that this would be the last time I'd speak to her. I watched the engagement live stream. The scene was even more beautiful than the drafts you originally drew. Everything was perfect except for the lack of hyacinths. After thinking for a moment, I added, I wish you both a long and happy marriage. Gail's smile faded, and the hand resting on the window tightened suddenly, the veins showing white, as if she hadn't heard a blessing. That hand bore a wedding ring. I lowered my gaze. Missing the look Gail gave me, Peter was silent for a moment, then lowered his voice. Gail, it's getting late. Don't waste time on irrelevant people. A very soft voice came from above my head. Gail said, Michael, don't regret this. She waited for a while, not receiving a response. She sneered, started the engine again, and sped off. I looked up blankly, only able to see the tail of that black car. It was a bit like the way she used to race sports cars, even if it's a blessing. As long as it comes from my mouth. Gail would be inexplicably angry. She's got issues, but I won't regret it. Chapter 5 After waiting so long without a taxi in sight, I had resigned myself to my fate when my phone suddenly buzzed. A brief message popped up, Where are you? I hesitated for a moment before sending my location. Half an hour later, I found myself sitting in a business car, a bit stiff as I held out my hand. The girl in front of me lowered her eyes, carefully treating my wounds. Vanessa looked up, Does it hurt? I tensed up as soon as she moved. Shaking my head, Vanessa lowered her head and blew on my hand, a cool sensation soothing the pain. I flinched and repeated, I said it doesn't hurt. Only then did Vanessa release my hand, replying slowly, didn't hear you. At that moment, I felt like a loyal retainer secretly colluding with an external enemy. As Gail's constant companion, in all ten of her fights, there would always be an eleventh with Vanessa. From schoolyard brawls to business battles, the two had always been mortal enemies, especially during Gail's two years of paralysis. Vanessa nearly swallowed up her entire business. Although I no longer have anything to do with Gail, it's still hard to shake off old habits. Vanessa lazily leaned back. There's a banquet tonight. I'm missing a male companion. I lowered my eyes as my wound was finally treated. Will Gail be there too? Vanessa nodded. I avoided her gaze and after a long silence, finally spoke. If you're thinking of using me to hurt Gail, you might be disappointed. She won't care about me. My voice was soft, quietly stating the facts. Vanessa toyed with a lighter a brief flash illuminating her knuckles as she said, don't be so sure. I turned to look at the rapidly passing street outside the window and smiled. I remembered Gail when we were 17, in front of all our friends. She had laughed, brazen and contemptuous. She said, Michael. I could never like Michael. Chapter 6. When I was taken to get my hair styled and try on suits, Vanessa was there the entire time. She had a discerning eye, 
Dismissing over a dozen custom suits as unsatisfactory, I didn't really want to attend the banquet, but with Vanessa insisting, I had no choice. Half a month ago, when I left the Liu family, I wasn't allowed to take anything with me. It was Mrs. Lee from the Lee family who temporarily took me in. So, whatever Vanessa wanted, I would try to comply. When I tried on a silver white suit, Vanessa's gaze finally settled. This one, I looked at the mirror beside me and suddenly froze. The person in the reflection was both unfamiliar and familiar. He looked like the quiet boy who had always stood silently behind Gail, nondescript and easily overlooked. Now suddenly striking and extraordinary, it was a version of myself I had never seen before. I reached out, cautiously touching the cold surface of the mirror. Vanessa walked over and personally adjusted my tie. I forget where I heard it, but a party is like a battlefield, and every boy should have a suit. Michael, it's not about making them angry, it's about letting Gail know that she's not just paralyzed, she's blind too. Chapter 7 this was my first time attending such a business banquet. Despite all the years I spent by Gail's side, I had never been her male companion. Vanessa and I arrived rather late. Just before entering the banquet hall, I glanced down at Vanessa. The lights of the hall illuminated her profile for a brief moment, her delicate features seemingly glowing. A soft murmur of surprise spread around us, pulling me back to reality. Who's that guy with young Miss Lee? They look perfect together. Isn't Miss Lee known for never bringing a male companion? Someone who had always been close to Gail stared at me for a moment before suddenly swearing. Damn, isn't that Miss Lou's plain-looking assistant? As soon as those words were spoken, I heard the sound of a wine glass shattering on the floor. I followed the sound. Gail stood not far away. Her wine glass smashed on the ground. Red wine soaking Peter's suit pants. Peter let out a low yelp, but Gail paid him no attention. She just stared at me, almost as if she were seeing me for the first time, a little dazed. This version of me left her both stunned and unfamiliar. Peter lifted his head, taking a moment before recognizing me, his expression one of utter disbelief. I nodded politely and began to socialize with Vanessa. It was only then that Gail noticed the woman beside me. Her gaze, once warm, turned cold inch by inch as she walked towards us, reaching out to pull me away. Vanessa reacted quickly, raising her hand to block Gail and pulling me slightly behind her. Gail looked past Vanessa, her eyes fixed on me. Michael, come here. I had never taken anyone else's side in front of her let alone hidden behind someone. Every time she called my name, no matter how far away, I would run to her. But now, things were different. I didn't take a single step back. Speaking as calmly and quietly as I always had when talking to her, I said, I've done enough over the years. The midsummer breeze flowed through the windows. Gail, we have nothing to do with each other anymore. Her face turned deathly pale in an instant. Chapter 8 Midsummer is a season for encounters. I was one of the children sponsored by the Lou family. It wasn't just me. Since the earthquake, Gail's mother had been helping rebuild our county. But the first time I went to the Lou family home was when I was 15. I was the top student in the county's high school entrance exam that year, and I accompanied some of the county officials to bring local specialties as a token of gratitude to Mrs. Lou. Mrs. Lou was just as gentle as I had imagined. She talked with the adults about plans for the following year, all the while taking countless phone calls. She seemed very busy. I stood on the side and caught a glimpse of a photo on her desk. The girl in the photo looked about my age, with delicate features and an impatient expression as she faced the camera. She had the rebellious air of a princess. The butler suddenly knocked on the door. His expression troubled. Madam, the young miss has gone out racing motorcycles again. Mrs. Liu, still busy, nodded absently. Go bring her back. The butler looked even more troubled. It seemed like a difficult task. One of the adults nudged me forward, laughing awkwardly. Mrs. Liu, why not let Michael go with them? He gets along well with his peers. It was only then that Mrs. Lou's gaze fell on me. I curled my fingers slightly, mustering the courage to nod. I can do it. Even if I couldn't, I had to. I followed the butler to the winding West Mountain Road where Gail was. She was only 17 at the time. Her black and red motorcycle sped through the wind, and it wasn't until she was close that she braked to a stop. Her fingers lifted the helmet, revealing her beautiful eyes. Lazy and cat-like, she said, Hey, country boy, who are you? I closed my eyes my face pale. I almost thought I was about to be run over. After a moment, I finally spoke. I'm Michael. Her interest was piqued. Her second question was, Mrs. Lou told me to bring you back. Her expression turned cold. Gail wasn't someone who followed orders, but I was also stubborn. If she didn't leave, neither would I. I just stood by the roadside, waiting for her. She completed one lap and saw me. On the second lap, she saw me again. By the third lap, she probably felt a bit embarrassed, annoyed. She threw down her bike and led me back. I followed behind her, noticing how slender she was. The midsummer evening breeze blew gently. I remembered her name. Gail. Chapter 9. Mrs. Lou wanted someone Gail's age to keep an eye on her, so she kept me around as Gail's sidekick. 
helping to make sure she didn't get into trouble. Gail was in her rebellious teenage years and particularly disliked me. Seeing me as her mother's spy, she constantly went out of her way to make things difficult for me. As Gail would put it, you're so annoying. Everyone knew that although Gail had countless romantic entanglements, there was always a quiet boy by her side, almost invisible, who only stepped in to stop her when she was being reckless. I focused on studying hard, meeting Mrs. Liu's expectations, and staying close behind Gail. This went on for seven or eight years, but I had a secret. The year I finished my college entrance exams, I stood beneath the jacaranda tree while Gail leaned against the courtyard railing. She spoke casually, yet it felt like she had suddenly squeezed my heart, peeling back my secret. She said, you like me. I froze, unable to move for a long time. The jacaranda blossoms fell on me, and it took a while before I heard my own voice. Horse and rough, yes, I like you. Gail gave a slight smile and turned to leave. That night, when I went to find Gail, as I pushed open the door to the private room, I heard the eldest daughter of the Lu family, leaning back on the sofa, laughing indulgently. Her voice wasn't loud, but it felt like I was going deaf, like everything hurt. Who would like Michael? I like guys like Peter. That was the first time I heard Peter's name. I was two years behind Gail, and I even skipped a grade in high school just to attend her university. But at that moment, I suddenly understood that some things couldn't be achieved through effort alone. Chapter 10 The 15-year-old Michael who first met Gail could never have imagined that. Years later, our relationship would still be so strained. Even at someone else's banquet, we could cause a scene, especially now. At Gail's first event since her recovery, she and Vanessa had never gotten along. So as soon as they entered the room, they attracted extra attention. Now, facing off, everyone was secretly watching the drama unfold. I squeezed Vanessa's shoulder. Let's go. Gail's eyelashes trembled, and I avoided her gaze. For the first time in all these years, in her presence, I told someone else, let's go. We had walked quite a distance before I turned back to glance at her. Gail was still standing there, head bowed, with a fragility and coldness that reminded me of the way she looked when she woke up from the car accident two years ago, back when Mrs. Liu, who had been in the car with her, was already gone. Peter tried to reach out to her, but a single glance from her froze him in place. I smiled slightly. Vanessa asked, what's so funny? I replied softly, I just realized that not everyone can do it. Not everyone can endure Gail's low moods and her spoiled temper. Not everyone, after seeing her other side, would still choose to stay close, especially during the time she was paralyzed. Gail, a proud daughter of heaven, couldn't accept that she had become disabled. She stopped smiling, lost all her vitality, and on top of that, her only family, Mrs. Liu, had died in that car accident. At that time, Gail had no will to live and tried to commit suicide multiple times. I smashed a glass and took a shard, pressing it hard against my wrist. If you want to die, that's fine, I'll go with you. Gail had never seen such a fierce emotion from me before. She stared at me with her dark eyes for a long time, almost through gritted teeth, and promised, Michael, I will get better. From that moment on, she cooperated with the doctor's treatment, and finally, two years later, she stood up, and then, she left her wheelchair behind. Chapter 11 After the banquet, I returned to the Lee family home with Vanessa. During this time, I've been grateful for Mrs. Lee's hospitality. I've been actively preparing my resume. Planning to move out as soon as I find a job, to be honest. Vanessa and I aren't really close. Every interaction we've had has been because Gail and Vanessa had fought, and I had to come to the Lee family to apologize on Gail's behalf. Mrs. Lee always received me warmly, fanning herself and saying, Oh, it's no big deal. Kids fight sometimes. Come, sit down. I would sit there awkwardly for an entire afternoon, watching Mrs. Lee apply ointment to Vanessa's injuries, the afternoon sunlight spilling across the room. It made me feel even more guilty. I never expected that in my time of need, it would be the Lee family that would lend me a hand. Vanessa and I aren't talkative people, so the car ride was particularly quiet. I felt a bit uneasy, sitting upright like a schoolboy, my eyes avoiding everything except the road ahead. But when I glanced up, I caught sight of Vanessa through the rearview mirror. She seemed a bit tired, her eyes closed, her long lashes making her look almost childlike. For a brief moment, the neon lights outside illuminated her face. Vanessa opened her eyes, catching me looking at her through the mirror. It was a little awkward, but not too much. I silently averted my gaze. Vanessa suddenly smiled and said, Michael, do you know what I thought the first time I saw you? How could I forget? She had shouted it right in front of Gail. I nodded and said, you asked me if I was blind. Otherwise why would I follow Gail around? Gail had been so angry that she fought with Vanessa again. Vanessa shook her head, then closed her eyes again. Outside, the traffic was endless. The car was silent for so long that I thought she had fallen asleep. But then I heard Vanessa's soft voice, 
I thought Gale must have found the dumbest guy ever, though dumb, you were very obedient. Chapter 12 It had been a long time since I visited Mrs. Lou's grave. I brought a bouquet of white flowers to the cemetery to see her. Gale had recently taken over the Lou Corporation, and not long after, a runaway truck had crashed into the Lou family's car, leaving one dead and one injured. She was a kind woman, without her, I wouldn't even know where I'd be now. I cleared the weeds from her grave and chatted with her slowly. Mrs. Lou, all the charities you cared about are still running smoothly, growing bigger each year. The foundation receives so many thank you letters that they can barely fit in a room. I lowered my eyes, watching a drop of dew on the flowers about to fall. Gail's paralysis has healed, and she's just like she used to be. The Lou Corporation is back on track. She got engaged recently, and the media made a huge deal out of it, calling the engagement ceremony a once-in-a-century event. You'd know the groom too, it's Peter the boy Gail once brought home. They're very much in love, and everything seems to be moving in a good direction, except for me. After all these years, I'm still stuck in the same place, with no direction. The woman in the photo on the tombstone looked gentle, as if she had heard everything I said. I touched the photo. I've left the Lou Corporation. Would you blame me? Of course, there was no answer. The cemetery was silent. Death has no sound. I covered my face, and tears seeped through my fingers. Except for those first few days, I haven't really been happy here. Sometimes I think, if I hadn't been the top scorer in that high school entrance exam, maybe I wouldn't have come here. I cried quietly for a while before gathering my things to leave. When I stood up, I noticed someone standing not far away, watching me. I didn't know how long they had been there. I lowered my eyes. There was only one path out of the cemetery, and I had to pass by Gail. She must have come to see Mrs. Lou as well, but our timing was unfortunate. As I was about to walk past her, I heard Gail speak, crying at my mom's grave. You. She hadn't finished her mocking words when I turned and looked at her, tears still lingering in my eyes. Gail swallowed the rest of her words. The truth is, Gail and I never had such a bad relationship. We've only had two real falling outs. Once, when I got tired of being her assistant and secretly sent out resumes, she found out and was furious. The other time was not long ago, when she received an email, read it, and then kicked me out of the Lou family. One happened before the car accident, the other after. Two years apart but I'm not as upset as I was back then. I just looked at her quietly and asked, on behalf of the boy I used to be, Gail, did you really think that because I never showed my emotions, I wouldn't feel hurt? Did you really think that no matter how much you messed around, I would always be like that 15-year-old boy, following behind you? Gail pressed her lips together, her eyes dark, her hand, hanging by her side, clenched and unclenched several times before tightening into a fist. Gail smirked sarcastically and said, Michael. You'll never be able to pay it all back. You killed my mom. Who are you trying to fool? Chapter 13 Even on my way back, my mind was still in a fog. Gail had thrown a final, chilling remark at me from her lofty perch. That car accident wasn't an accident. Guess who betrayed the Lou family? My inbox received an email. With trembling hands, I opened it. Inside were pieces of information gathered by Gail's people, all pointing to one conclusion. The car accident was deliberately caused. At the time, Mrs. Lou and Gail were on their way to sign a major contract, and their whereabouts had been kept absolutely confidential, except from me. I was the only one who knew. I was Gail's assistant and had grown up in the Lou family. They had always trusted me. Among the attachments was a photo of me meeting with someone from a rival company. The timing was highly suspicious, right before the accident, but the photo was fabricated. I didn't even know that person. In Gail's eyes, I was the only possible traitor. She didn't even bother to confront me. She had already sentenced me to death in her mind. I let out a bitter laugh, curling up in my seat, no wonder, no wonder she had me draw up the proposal site plans one day and then told me to leave the next, no wonder she would rather chase after Peter than have anything to do with me, I closed the email, not even trying to defend myself, because I knew Gail wouldn't listen, the truth was, if Gail had dug just a little deeper, she would have realized that I wasn't the only one who knew her whereabouts, Peter did too, chapter 14, I hadn't slept this long in ages, even before Gail's accident, I had been quietly sending out resumes behind her back. Peter was too aggressive, and I was genuinely tired. He was the only official boyfriend Gail had ever had, and she spoiled him to the point where he was unbearable. He especially couldn't stand me. In the past, her other male friends had given me trouble, but none as intense as Peter. Can you imagine a boy in his early twenties being called a gigolo in front of the entire company? Peter did that. It was during the days when Gail was negotiating contracts, and she and Mrs. Lou had kept their whereabouts secret not even telling Peter, he couldn't reach Gail, but I knew where she was, he asked me, and I refused to tell him, even blocking him from entering the chairman's office, 
Everyone in the company knew he was Gale's favorite, but I was the only one brave, or foolish, enough to stand in his way. Peter called everyone over to watch as he slapped me across the face. And what did he say? Michael. Even if you stripped naked in front of Gale, she wouldn't look at you. Get out of my way. You think clinging to the Lou family is going to lift you out of that poor county you came from? Always hanging around Gale. It's disgusting. Like a mistress. I hadn't done anything wrong. Yet in that moment, under everyone's gaze, I felt as though I'd been stripped bare. Humiliated. He barged into the office and saw Gale's schedule. The next day, Gale and Mrs. Lou had their accident. I never suspected Peter. Because Gale and Mrs. Lou treated him so well. But now I understand. Only those who aren't loved carefully remember the kindness they receive. Desperately thinking of ways to repay it. I am that kind of person. Chapter 15. When I woke up. The world had changed. The top trending topic on Facebook was hashtag South City Lou family car accident conspiracy. People love gossip about wealthy families. Especially since Gail's grand proposal had dominated online discussions not too long ago. An insider revealed that Gail's car accident was not an accident at all, but a premeditated act orchestrated by a rival group. The insider claimed that it was Gail's assistant who leaked her whereabouts. Supposedly a man from a poor background who had been sponsored by the Lou family for years. The post included a picture of me meeting with someone from the rival group, the same photo I had received in my email. The allegations were presented as undeniable truth, as if the accuser had witnessed it firsthand. Peter also responded, much more subdued than before, smiling softly on camera, Michael, I never liked him, but he was always around Gail. I even argued with Gail because of him. I never expected him to do something like this. The interview was long. And his words subtly accused me of being a third wheel, of being ungrateful. A classic example of the treacherous poor man in a wealthy family drama. Gail stood beside him, her expression indifferent. I'd already seen the comments online. They took care of this assistant for so many years, and he turned out to be a traitor. Mrs. Lou must be heartbroken. Poor Peter. He had to put up with this assistant while he was dating Gail. Report him to the police already. He shouldn't get away with this. Who can dig up where this guy is now? What company would still hire him? I have to say. It's amazing that Peter and Gail have made it this far. True love conquers all. Someone suddenly snatched the phone out of my hand. I looked up to see Vanessa staring at my pale face. Stop looking at that. Grandma's calling us for dinner. My lips moved slightly as I tried to explain. It wasn't me. Vanessa didn't even pause. I know. It wasn't just lip service. She truly believed me. Chapter 16. Just as the online comment suggested. Every interviewer who seemed interested in hiring me suddenly turned me down. If I couldn't clear my name. I'd probably be socially dead forever, never able to find work again. This was the outcome Gail wanted for me, a fate miserable enough to satisfy her anger. The only company still willing to take me on was the Lee families, where I had sent my resume along with many others, but I refused. Vanessa was flipping through my resume without looking at me and asked, why? I shook my head, my reputation is bad now. Any company that hires me will be thrust into the spotlight, and that wouldn't be good for the Lee family. Vanessa turned her head and quietly studied me for a moment before smiling with a hint of resignation. Michael, you're so dense. Dense about what? I stared at her, confused. But before I could respond, the police arrived to take me away. The Lou family had reported me. And as a person of interest and suspect in the case, I was, of course, subject to interrogation. Before entering the interrogation room, I saw Gail and Peter. Their expressions were quite telling. Peter had the look of a gambler going all in. I could understand. After all. He had handled things so cleanly over the past two years that any evidence had likely vanished. The only obstacle between him and Gail now was me. Once I was locked away, he could truly rest easy, secure in the knowledge that their grand proposal was genuine and that their upcoming wedding would be the envy of many. Gail's expression as she looked at me was more complicated. I noticed her fingers were unconsciously rubbing together, trembling slightly. She glanced at me, then turned her head away, her eyes tinged with red. I averted my gaze and entered the interrogation room, in a matter of hours. The police had thoroughly investigated my entire life. In addition to that photo, there was more evidence pointing to me, coincidentally all too neatly, as if woven into a web meant to trap me. I was temporarily detained, though it was only for 10 days. The case of the Lou family car accident had gained so much attention online that conspiracy theories were spreading like wildfire, and the authorities were taking it very seriously. They had gathered a significant police force, determined to handle the case with the utmost fairness and thoroughness, leaving no stone unturned. During those 10 days, I didn't think about much. It had been a long time since I'd rested so well, sleeping soundly and deeply. On the 10th day, the truth came to light, and I was released without charges. This time, the authorities found that, in addition to the rival group responsible for the attack on the Lou family, another person was implicated, Peter. The net of justice may be vast. 
but it doesn't let anything slip through. The police cleared my name. The moment I stepped out of the city police station, I was bombarded by a barrage of flashing lights, so intense that I couldn't open my eyes. Reporters who had been waiting outside seized the moment, thrusting microphones at me and bombarding me with questions. Mr. Michael, what do you think of the news that it was actually Peter who betrayed the Lou Corporation? Mr. Michael, after all these years by Gail's side, was it because you had feelings for her? Mr. Michael, when Lou was paralyzed, the person who stayed by her side wasn't Peter who took care of her, was it you? I could hardly catch my breath, but thankfully, a hand pulled me away. Vanessa shoved a bunch of clearing flowers into my arms and carefully guided me into the car. As I got into the car, I glanced back, the media lights flashing chaotically. I saw Gail, standing at a distance, looking exhausted and defeated, her expression fragile. I answered the last question from the media, in a soft voice. I said, no, the person who stayed by Gail's side then wasn't me. Chapter 17 In those 10 days, so much had happened. The internet had initially been filled with curses and death wishes for someone like me. But then the revelations began to pour in. The first ripple was caused by someone posting photos of Peter in Milan, exposing the lies he had woven. People quickly learned that when Gail had her accident, Peter had left her and flown to Milan. While he enjoyed a peaceful life, she struggled under the weight of her burdens. They were two entirely separate lives. The love story that everyone admired was rooted in the belief that he had stood by her during her darkest times. When it was revealed as a ploy, people were disgusted. The second ripple came when someone posted a video of Peter slapping me. The video was quite clear, showing how I was humiliated, holding my swollen face while still trying to block Peter from entering Gail's office, only to be pushed to the ground. Peter had always presented himself as gentle and amiable, but in the video, his expression was wild and almost feral. His polished professional image, which he had carefully cultivated through workplace reality shows and social media, shattered. Word spread that Peter was too afraid to even answer his phone, as he was being cursed by everyone. More and more revelations surfaced. Blurring the lines between truth and fiction. Then, the police report came out, declaring me innocent and Peter became a wanted man. Such an official announcement carried more weight than anything else. The interviewers who had previously rejected me began reaching out again, but I turned them all down, including the Lee family. I received a call from my hometown. The old principal of my middle school, a woman as respectable as Mrs. Liu, asked if I would consider returning to teach, to help support the county's education. I agreed. I made one last visit to the Liu family home. This time, no one could stop me. The things I had left behind were still there. I thought the room would be covered in dust, but when I opened the door, it was clean and bright, with sunlight falling on freshly folded flowers on the table. I packed quickly, but hesitated when I opened the drawer. I reached into a hidden compartment and pulled out a photograph, an early one, taken with an old camera. The girl in the photo was full of spirit, her hair blowing in the evening wind. She was laughing and playing with her friends, but for some reason, she had turned back, as if to check if the person behind her was keeping up. It was a photo I had secretly taken of Gail when I was 17. At the time, I thought, no one can capture the midsummer wind, but I could capture it in a photo. I didn't take the photo with me. I left it on the table, leaving it to Gail's choice whether to keep it or throw it away. The jacaranda tree in the courtyard was blooming again, its branches hanging low. I stood there for a moment, admiring it. Gail stood behind me, calling my name softly, Michael, as if afraid of disturbing a dream. I turned around and smiled at her, calm and at peace. Gail's eyes were dark and bruised. Her face, despite all the skincare and cosmetic treatments, was haggard. As the eldest daughter of the Lou family, I had never seen her look so cautious, almost humble. Her eyelashes trembled, and her voice was hoarse. Ever since I started recovering, I've been investigating the car accident. But when I found evidence pointing to you, I couldn't look any further. Just thinking about those pieces of evidence made it hard to breathe. I never thought you would betray us. Once that idea took root, I couldn't stop it. She suddenly laughed at herself. You understand, right? People like us get betrayed often. We're used to being stabbed in the back. But when it involved you, I couldn't handle it. Do you know what I thought when I was going through that information? I wished I had just died in that car accident. After that, I lost control and did all those terrible things. The grand proposal. It was all for you to see. She spoke a lot, detailing her inner struggles. But I simply looked at her, my gaze clear, and softly interrupted. No. Gail froze. I smiled faintly. You already knew you were wrong when you did it, but you thought it didn't matter whether it was right or wrong, whether my betrayal was real or just a misunderstanding. No matter what you did, you believed I would forgive you. The truth is, I always knew that if Gail hadn't been paralyzed and abandoned by everyone around her, she wouldn't have noticed me. Her gaze was always on men like Peter. Even the ring she gave me didn't fit. She was silent for a long time, and I thought it was just the shadow of a leaf falling to the ground. But it was Gail's tears. She reached out, 
gripping my wrist, pleading, I've been a jerk, one last time, can you forgive me? The jacaranda tree cast its dappled light and shadow. I remembered a long time ago, when I was 17, Gail had leaned against the railing, smiling lazily, Michael, do you like me? But now, I thought for a moment, then gently pulled her hand away. I won't forgive you. She saw the grayish-brown scar on my wrist, her pupils dilating, her lips trembling, but she couldn't say a word. I spoke patiently, as if comforting a child. Gail, your life was saved by Mrs. Liu in that car accident. You need to live well. The Liu Corporation was her life's work, and you need to protect it. I'm leaving here. Gail's face turned deathly pale, losing all color. In that moment, it felt as though her heart had been hollowed out. Someone she had always taken for granted was leaving her for good. The midsummer wind never looks back. Chapter 18. Recently, South City has been abuzz with turmoil. The once celebrated couple at the center of the grand proposal has now been branded as a scumbag and a disgrace. Peter's wrongdoings have come to light, and Gail is seen as his accomplice. The Loot Corporation's stock has plummeted, and for some reason, Gail crashed her car, breaking her leg, and is now confined to a wheelchair. I was on a bus back to the county when I received a message from Gail. She said, I'll repay everything I owe you. I casually blocked her number. I turned to look out the window, the scenery passing by in a blur. The glass of the bus window reflected the person next to me, Vanessa, who seemed to enjoy sleeping, now leaning back with her eyes closed. She's the CEO of a big company, yet she insisted on donating school supplies and even shared this bumpy bus ride with me. The bus swayed, and Vanessa's head rested on my shoulder, but she didn't wake up. I smiled softly, looking ahead at the changing scenery. I felt an unwavering certainty. I was about to embrace countless midsummers of my own.